Welcome to Repro's Fight Back, a podcast on all things repro. I'm your host, Jenny Wetter, and each episode I will be taking you to the front lines of the escalating fight over our sexual and reproductive health and rights at home and abroad. Each episode, I will be speaking with leaders who are fighting to protect our reproductive health and rights to ensure that no one's reproductive health depends on where they live. It's time for Repros to fight back. Welcome to Repros Fight Back. This week marks a really exciting moment. We have been doing this podcast for one year already. I cannot believe we've already been doing this for a year. It has flown by so fast. Um, I've had so much fun doing it and talking to amazing people and getting to bring so many amazing issues to the listeners. Um, So I want to thank the people who have really helped me do this. One, thank you to everybody at Population Institute for supporting this podcast and making sure that it happens. Two, thank you to Megan McWilliams. She has been our amazing editor and has made us sound wonderful. Um, and three, extra big thank you to Rachel Marchand. She has been responsible for managing our website and all of the social media for the podcast and make sure that all of this great stuff gets out into the world. Um, and also just a huge thank you to the listeners. I'm so grateful that you have been listening and have been enjoying learning more about these issues and finding ways that you can fight back. So with that, we'll move on to another year and hopefully a lot more great topics and a lot more ways that you can get involved and fight back on all the things that are happening with the Trump-Pence administration. So with that, today we're going to talk about something we haven't spent a lot of time on so far, and that is the federal judiciary. Uh, The Trump administration is reshaping our judicial landscape. Um, and helping me explain that what the Trump administration has been doing to reshape the judiciary, I'm really excited to have with me today Kate Ryan from NARAL Pro- Pro-Choice America. So thank you. Hi, Kate. Thanks so much for being here today. Hey, Jenny. Thank you for having me. So we're going to talk about the way the Trump administration is reshaping the federal courts. So I figured before we get to like what exactly is happening, that people might not have a lot of information about the basic federal court system in general. So maybe you want to start and do some quick background on that. Sure. I would be happy to. There is no reason for most people right. to have those details. <laughs> uh, so basically, the way the federal judiciary works, so the federal court structure has three levels, the district courts, which are basically the trial courts. That's where the majority of cases occur. The circuit courts, which are the courts of appeal. So that's the first level of appeal. Basically, if a party disagrees with the ruling of the district court, they can appeal it to the circuit courts. And then the final level of appeal is Supreme Court, obviously, which people are familiar with. Um, And then the jurisdiction is limited to cases uh, challenging or cases that are brought on the basis of the U.S. Constitution or federal statute. So not every law or lawsuit um, would come up the federal court system, but it shouldn't send the signal that just because it's a federal court, a state law couldn't end up at the Supreme Court. So, for example, a state law that would that is passed in violation of Roe would still fall under federal jurisdiction because it would be a violation of the Constitution. Gotcha. Uh, and just for numbers, because before I started working on a court system, I certainly didn't have a sense oh, of the yeah, scope. No. There are 94 district courts and over 670 district court judges and 13 circuit courts of appeals, and there are almost 180 circuit court judges. And to be clear, not every judge on a, let's say, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals sits for every case. They sort of rotate uh, to handle caseload, but they're the numbers. Yeah, I definitely didn't have an idea of the district court level. Like, I'm more familiar with, like, the appeals court level, but, like, once you get lower... Most cases stay at those levels. A small percentage get up to the Supreme Court and not that much larger percentage gets up to the circuit courts. Most cases are handled at the district court level. Uh, So don't get a whole lot of press usually. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) For uh, how Trump is reshaping the courts, I figured we would start with the one that everybody is probably the most familiar with. So why don't we talk a little bit about how the Supreme Court has changed? Yeah. So it's been a brutal year after the Supreme Court uh, fight around Brett Kavanaugh's nomination and subsequent confirmation. 
I'm not going to dive all the way into Kavanaugh because that could be its own right. episode. <laughs> uh, but I will talk a little bit about what was at stake with the Kavanaugh fight and what continues to be at stake. Essentially, the issue uh, with the Supreme Court is that prior to the retirement of Justice Kennedy, it had been widely considered that there were four conservative justices, four more liberal-leaning ones, and then uh, Justice Kennedy was seen as a quote-unquote swing vote. He wasn't necessarily a swing vote, but he was slightly more moderate, so he sometimes went either way. Um, with his retirement and with the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh to that seat, uh, there is now considered to be a conservative majority, so a five-voting uh, block um, in favor of conservative ideology, which, of course, for reproductive freedom means there is now a direct threat to Roe. Um, and this, just to be clear, is and has always been the plan uh, from the anti-choice movement. The story uh, that I became familiar with working when I was doing work kind of in this space uh, that resonates with me is that essentially after the Supreme Court recognized the constitutional right to abortion in Roe, you know, anti-choice groups and politicians were trying to overturn it. So there were repeated attempts to pass a federal law banning abortion that were unsuccessful. Uh, so essentially they ended up settling on sort of a two-part strategy, and this sort of sounds like a conspiracy except there are citations because it wasn't meant to be a secret. Uh, Pat Buchanan, who was the comms director for then-President Reagan, publicly acknowledged sort of one part of the strategy, which would be to seek out anti-choice Supreme Court nominees. He, I'm paraphrasing a little bit of this quote, but basically what he said is, our conservative appointment strategy could do more to advance the social agenda, school prayer, anti-pornography, anti-busing, right to life, and quotas and employment than anything Congress can accomplish in 20 years. So basically they knew wow. we need a five-vote conservative majority on the court to get done what we want to get done. And of course, appointing or you know, nominating and then getting confirmed lower court judges, so the district and circuit courts, were creating essentially a farm team for this, you know, perfect Supreme Court that right. they were envisioning. And then the second part of the strategy was considered to be chipping away at abortion rights wherever possible at the state level. Um, and it's actually pretty well described in an internal DOJ memo in Reagan's DOJ. And essentially it says, no one seriously believes that the court's about to overturn Roe v. Wade. So the key question is how to advance the goals of bringing about the eventual overruling of Roe v. Wade and in the meantime of mitigating its effects. So essentially trying to chip away at the rights in the meantime and eventually get a case before uh, the Supreme Court. One of the young lawyers who wrote this memo, secret and awesome surprise, uh, it's now Justice Samuel Alito. So he's oh, living lovely. his young lawyer, young anti-choice lawyerly goal. I mean, this is this the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh was the achievement of this uh, one part of this goal, and obviously we've been seeing the incremental chipping away of abortion rights, the second part of that strategy for decades. Uh, so, in terms of what Trump has done to the Supreme Court, you know, we're now waiting for cases that could be used to gut yeah. or overturn Roe, and there's quite a few of them in the pipeline. Yeah. So, I'm gonna. <laughs> I think. I'll leave it the Supreme Court there yeah. uh, for now. But that's, I, I think it's important history for folks that I certainly didn't know about until I started working in this space. Yeah, no, I wasn't as familiar. I mean, I knew that was clearly what was happening, but like less about like the actual documents that like, this is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it was real clear. I mean, we all knew that when Kennedy retired, like everything changed. I was out of the country and oh, were you? so I yeah, I was at Girls Not Brides in uh, Kuala Lumpur. So like I woke up and was like, What just happened? And like <laughs> oh, it just like the bottom dropped out. Yeah, there had been you know, there had been a lot of rumors as there always are at the end of a Supreme Court term that somebody might retire and there were rumors Kennedy might Kennedy might retire and one of my coworkers who I work on nominations issues with I was in a coworker's office, and she kind of ran by. I was sort of like, "Oh, there you are, Kennedy retired." And my response was actually, "Oh, you're hilarious." Right. I really thought she was kidding. Yeah. She was not kidding, but it was hard for me to even comprehend that what she was telling me was was real. It just changed everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's leave that nightmare behind <laughs> happily <laughs> and move on to uh, the circuit courts, right? Yeah, yeah. So the courts of appeals 
So actually, before I jump into that, I'll just say, so Trump has sent 157 judicial nominees to the Senate. Of those, about a quarter have documented anti-choice records. It doesn't mean that there aren't more that are anti-choice. Right. But these are f- nominees who have already clearly stated that they're opposed to reproductive freedom. Well, I think it's also worth pointing out, why has Trump sent so many um, already? Oh, yeah. Well, so that's fair. So uh, towards the end of the Obama administration, um, when Mitch McConnell was the leader of the Senate, well, you know, became the leader of the Senate, he essentially they stopped confirming nominees. So when Trump took office, there were over 100 federal judicial vacancies sitting there waiting for Trump to to fill them. Uh, so that's part of it. Um, and then as he's moved through the past two years, of course, judges continue right. to retire. So 76 lower court judges have been confirmed so far, and 76 more nominees are pending in the Senate, and there are actually still 60 vacancies uh, that haven't even been filled in terms of nominees. So what can happen in the next two years is is a lot of of people. And in terms of kind of breaking it down a little bit, on the circuit court uh, side, 29 judges have been confirmed. Um, which means that one in six circuit court judges are currently Trump appointees. So in terms of him remaking wow. the courts and his image, he's, he's getting there. Uh, and obviously that ratio will rise. And of these 29, 15 are solidly anti-choice. So more than 50% of his circuit court judges are definitely anti-choice. And there have already been instances of judges that didn't have, nominees I should say, that didn't have documented anti-choice records when they were going through the confirmation process, but since uh, being confirmed, have uh, made it clear, made anti-choice kind of rulings in their, uh, the scope of their work since more really, if we kind of do kind of a a look back at sort of where folks are, we actually haven't done that, but it'd be an interesting thing to look at of who uh, didn't have demonstrated positions, but now we know that they in fact were. Um, it's not surprising given Trump's you kind of, of assume test with yeah. the courts and wanting judges that would overturn Roe. Um, but then at the district court level, there are about 47 judges. Well, there are 47 judges that have been confirmed. Uh, part of the reason why that number is sort of small as it compares to the circuit courts, it's that McConnell, they're more important, essentially. Uh, many consider them to be more important. So they've been prioritizing the Senate circuit court nominees and then seemingly uncontroversial district court nominees. Okay. Uh, so there are a whole bunch of district court nominees that are more controversial sort of waiting uh, that McConnell certainly intends to ram through. No question. Yeah. I think it was just good to like pause on the, like why there were so many, because so many yeah. people were familiar with holding the Supreme court seat open, right. but didn't know that there were so many lower court seats that were also held open oh, yeah. um, for the new administration. No, it's a really good point because it is sort of, we were familiar with that one, but there were actually over a hundred others. Yeah. And I think it's probably really important to know before kind of jumping into some examples of, of Trump's nominees that his nominees have been overwhelmingly white and male. Uh, and they've been both younger and meaner, frankly, uh, than any nominees we've seen in recent history based on the types of things they've said. And I want to be really clear when I note the demographics that we don't want to see a nod to diversity on the bench. It's not to say that there haven't, you know, there have been anti-choice women confirmed Mm -hmm. and Clarence Thomas exists. Right. Uh, But we want to actually see nominees who reflect our diverse country and who value equality under the law and will uphold our fundamental constitutional rights. And part of what we want to, we need and want to see are judges that are not overwhelmingly young white men, which is what we're dealing with right now. And he has, Trump has repeatedly nominated individuals that have demonstrated records of hostility towards repro rights, towards LGBTQ rights, towards civil rights, immigration rights. It's not these, you know, if they're bad on repro, they're often bad on multiple other things. Right. Um, you know. Because they're all often they're connected. Right. Exactly. And viro, labor rights, consumer protections. I mean, you name it, like Kavanaugh, most of them are bad on many, if not all of those things and mm-hmm. have demonstrated records on at least several. <laughs> um, and so we're sort of seeing these nominees who are so ideologically driven 
um, which is one area of concern, certainly. And then another area that has gotten quite a lot of press is that m- this is not something you typically see from a president, but he has nominated, maybe not surprising from this president, multiple individuals who have been rated by the nonpartisan kind of independent American Bar Association as not qualified. Just because a nominee gets well qualified doesn't mean we would support them, right, certainly, right. but it's a, essentially what they're it saying like is... It seems like the bare minimum. Yeah. It's it, a saying you are, in fact, a lawyer who shows up and does your job. Uh, but there are folks who have received not qualifieds because of ethics violations and overbilling practices or work ethic is one of my personal favorites. It was a judge they deemed was not qualified because apparently he didn't really show up for work all the time in his current job. And yes, Seems like you would want someone who was, you know, you'd think you could find work. a conservative lawyer who at least showed up for work. I don't know, but apparently not. So this is, you know, these are the kind of the two pieces of what we're seeing. And so, you know, for example, there are two circuit court, there are many circuit court nominees pending, but two I'll lift up because they are being, they were nominated over the objection of one of the home state senators, um, Sherrod Brown, Senator Brown, you know, his Ohio was in the sixth part of the Sixth Circuit. And so typically uh, senators would consult with the White House in selecting nominees. Um, But obviously that was not done. And so Senator Brown is really uh, strongly opposing these two nominees. One of them, Chad Riedler, a nominee to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, is currently at Trump's DOJ, and his name is on every, basically every bad policy that Trump has moved forward. This is a guy whose name, uh, he defended the Trump administration's efforts to stop Jane Doe, the undocumented young woman, from accessing uh, abortion care. He defended um, Trump's rules that he put forward gutting the contraceptive coverage policy. He, I believe, is on brief. Let me double check my notes so you'll maybe hear my paper. I apologize. Um, On briefs around, yep, defended the Trump administration's policy of separating families at the border. I mean, this this guy is obviously opposing the ACA uh, under the Trump administration. He is all of the worst hits. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's basically everything you can kind of think of. And that's really, you know, me just naming mostly repro things. But he wrote an op-ed entitled Make Death Penalty for Youth Available Widely. What? Yep. He argued, uh. quote, the execution of those who commit capital offenses at 16 or 17 does not constitute cruel and unusual punishment. So obviously I'm not an expert on the death penalty. Right. But it's just worth noting that these... Trump is finding some of the most extreme people one could possibly find. Um, And then the other, the Sixth Circuit nominee, Eric Murphy, uh, is the Solicitor General for Ohio. And so he has defended Ohio's efforts to defund Planned Parenthood. He has defended uh, trap regulations, which were struck down by the Supreme Court as unconstitutional in Whole Woman's Health v. Hellerstead. He has... Uh, supported, he submitted a brief in support of Arizona's 20 week abortion ban. You know, these, these folks all have an ideological agenda and that's really where, uh, presumably why Trump, uh, one, one could make a guess that the Federalist Society and the Heritage Foundation are weighing in on the lower court knobs, not just Kavanaugh. And, you know, that's certainly part of an ideological agenda, but also your standard anti-choice groups, right? They, they know that, if they can take over the courts, they can potentially achieve their ultimate goal, which is overturning Roe. I mean, and we've already seen with HHS and stuff that they have a lot of influence in this administration. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so there's, I would not be surprised to learn that they are significantly weighing in in the context of lower court nominations as well. Um, You know, and then these are circuit courts, but they're district court nominees who have extreme, extreme, extreme records as well. Uh, Stephen Clark is nominated for the uh, Eastern District of Missouri. This is a guy who has he's a he run he's a partner he's a private lawyer, um, but he you know it's hard for me to kind of wrap my mind around it. So I'm trying to think of the best way <laughs> to kind of get into his record because he is really extreme. Uh, so he basically submitted a brief on behalf of several anti-choice orgs that were are opposing the contraceptive coverage policy of the ACA, making all of these incredible claims of things, science-based things that are obviously not true. Um, 
So, you know, it asserts that contraception causes a higher risk of like heart attack and stroke and all the, you know, just lots of anti-science stuff. So in it, there's all these inaccurate, irresponsible claims. And he, Clark, did apparently consult with sort of what he deemed to be science advisors in putting the brief together. But actually, um, you know, the doctors that he worked with are kind of known anti-abortion activists. And in fact, he's actually been like reprimanded by judges for using skewed statistics in his briefs and talked about, the judge actually talked about this nominee is kind of science advisor is somebody who has a disturbing apath- apathy toward the accuracy of his testimony. And so this is who kind of Stephen I mean, Stephen that seems Clark pretty is, harsh for a for judge, judge to say. To really like weigh yeah. in basically saying, if you're telling me this is your science advisor, then we've got a problem, buddy. Um, and this is just kind of one example. There's a, you know, somewhat, it's, this case sounds, you know, kind of, abs- I don't know if absurd is the right word, but... He also represented a woman who was trying to gain rights to several of her frozen embryos that were created with her ex-husband through in vitro. The woman wanted to use them to get pregnant, but her ex-husband objected, essentially, I think, arguing Mm -hmm. that we're divorced because I don't want any more children with you. Whatever your feelings about the the facts of that case, Clark, the nominee, Stephen Clark, and his client, he argued essentially that he really he made the he actually says that uh the 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 couple had ex- living have had children and he suggests that the children would have to like navigate the murky psychological waters of knowing basically that their siblings had died at the hand of their father siblings he's referring to the frozen embryos i mean in terms of wow. the ex- extremeness of his positions i mean this guy is and he's going to potentially probably if mcconnell has his way become a federal judge you know and this is this is sort of what we're seeing you know i'll kind of dump and drive into one more and then feel free to stop me because some of it's just (laughs) really depressing uh but there's also a district court for the eastern uh, i'm sorry for the district of nebraska nominee brian boucher who He's a Nebraska attorney general. He ran for the office of Nebraska of attorney general in 2014. And this is so there are actually all these videos because it was mm-hmm. part of his campaign. And he talks about supporting abortion bans, about um, wanting to essentially ban abortion right now if we could, um, you know, and has filled out questionnaires for Nebraska right to life, essentially saying that he doesn't even support um access to abortion in cases of rape and incest. Like, you know, we're talking about the extreme of the extreme. Right. Um, and that's kind of your almost standard uh, Trump nominee. And part of it, it's important to note that it's extremely anti-choice as they are, the the real theme of anti-science that runs through all of these folks. And most of these nominees are also bad on other issues, as I right. mentioned. And so it's really not just, I mean, as if this wouldn't be enough. It is enough. But it, it, it is clear that it kind of cuts across the board. And there are other nominees, you know, who this nominee for a district in Utah who was on a brief opposing the whole women's health case. He supported Proposition 8 in California. And the NRA refers to him as their go-to guy. You know, across the board yeah. problematic. So this is – when we say that Trump's remaking the courts, um, it's real. And he – I, I apologize, I won't remember the details, but I read an article not that long ago talking about, you know, obviously it's not necessarily even how judges retire in some right. terms of Trump maybe having more nominees to the Fifth Circuit than the Second Circuit or what have you. So he may get to a point, so while the ratio is sort of that one in six federal judges been appointed by Trump, uh, he may get to a point where you have are flipping circuits, circuits that were right. seen as progressive or had primarily uh, appointees from Democratic presidents uh, flipping, essentially. So it's not – the circuit cuts aren't as clear-cut as Supreme Court in that Mm -hmm. sense. But, you know, the more and more Trump judges on a circuit court, the more we're going to have pretty serious problems for reproductive rights because of the way that these state restrictions move through the federal court system. Well, there's a couple of things you said that like really struck me. Is one is just this whole tone of anti-science. So my background is actually in environmental science. I know. I did not know. <laughs> yeah, 
long and winding road to get to repro, but, (laughs) um, yes. So science is like always near and dear to my heart. And so it's really just watching just the complete erosion of science in general throughout this administration and seeing it happening in the courts as well with the appointments. Mm -hmm. It's frustrating. Yeah. Um, and, and that's sort of why I read their words, because I do want to make it clear that, you know, one might think that I'm kind of, you know, paraphrasing right. or it sounds worse than it is. But using their own words, it's a little bit harder to make that argument. Yeah. And like, so a lot of attention, I think, has been paid to the fact that there's a lot of white men mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. have been appointed. But also equally important is young white men. Right. So These are all they'll be on the court appointments for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you're not wrong. There are nominees in their 30s. I mean, actually, I'm pre- I don't remember who, uh, but there actually have been uh, the American Bar Association, the organization I referred to earlier, have raised qualification questions around some of the nominees who are just so young that they uh-huh. basically have no legal experience yet. <laughs> so, and lifetime appointments, right? right? It's not just the Supreme Court. They're all lifetime appointments. Uh, and it's at, kind of, as I mentioned, it's the farm team, right? Your district court judges are the ones that tend to be the pool for the circuit court judges, which tend to be the pool for a next Supreme Court nomination. And we almost certainly have at least two more years of Trump, and who's to say what will happen right. in terms of whether or not he might get another Supreme Court vacancy to fill, which is terrifying. Yeah, I I, I can't think about the court we already have. Mm-hmm. So the thought of there being (laughs) Uh more, like, I just, my brain stops at that point. It's like, no. Yeah, that's, yeah, you're not alone. So now we have kind of the landscape of what it looks like right now. So what does this mean going forward? So overall, I would say that it's, it's really not overstating it to say that basically all of the thing, all the progressive values that we all care about are at stake, right? The Supreme Court before Brett Kavanaugh gutted the Voting Rights Act, right. the Supreme Court before Brett Kavanaugh ruled against organized labor in Janus overturning decades-long precedent. So anybody who says that they won't overturn Roe because of decades-long precedent, see Janus. Right. Like, they absolutely will. That's not a question uh, in my mind. And and that's going to be true, I'm afraid, across the board, right? We're looking, you know... At any look at any one of Trump's terrible policies, the Muslim ban, any of the terrible things they're doing in the environmental space, worker space, consumer protections, anything that gets up to the Supreme Court or even appellate courts that that he's flipping and packing with right. more conservative judges. I don't remember the exact number, but the vast majority, and I'm not talking 50 percent, it's like I should double check this, are decided below the Supreme Court level. Most cases uh, are decided at the lower courts. Mm-hmm. Uh, so as he's remaking these, these, these courts with hundreds of new, young, conservative ideologues, we're going to start to, people are going to start feeling that in their daily life. Most people don't feel like the Supreme Court kind of hits them where they live. Right. It feels removed. But as the court is upholding terrible laws or striking down good laws, uh, people are going to start to feel it, unfortunately. And I just hope it's not uh, too late to do anything about it. You know, and in the space of, of repro, that's sort of what I mean in terms of, and if you mentioned earlier, there are already cases in the pipeline right. that could challenge Roe. And of course, yes, they could outright overturn it, um, but they could also Death essentially of a thousand cuts, right? And or essentially decide using Casey's undue burden standard that basically no burden counts as an undue burden, um, mm-hmm. basically opening up and welcoming states to pass any and all restrictions they can possibly think of. This election, the midterms, we really did make some good progress at uh, electing more progressives to the state legislatures, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but for a long time they've been, you know, we've had sort of these three Republican trifectas of governor, you know, assembly or house, Senate and states. Uh, They've been passing bad law, bad law, bad law, attacking repro, but also attacking LGBTQ rights, et cetera. Um, You know, voting rights, obviously. Um, And so as these bad laws come up before these super conservative judges, I'm, I'm genuinely afraid um, of what might happen. And I think it's also important, 
I know both of our organizations actually do report cards on reproductive mm-hmm. health and rights. Mm-hmm. So you can already see there are, it, it's not, it's already not easy to access abortion care or access, exercise your reproductive rights across the U.S. There are places where it's already virtually, um, it might as well be banned, right? Right. Like, right. Roe is not a reality for women, right. many, many, many women all across the country. So this Millions only seeks to just exacerbate that so much and make it so much harder. And, you know, and again, that burden isn't felt equally, right? Like, I am privileged. I live in D.C. I have money. So even if it were outlawed in D.C., I could travel. Um, there's so many people where that's not their reality to be able to travel to a clinic in the next state and then have a waiting period or something. So I have to go twice. Yeah. Um, so it, there are real concerns about it could remain legal, but just completely inaccessible. Yeah, Absolutely. I'm terrified that that's where we're we're heading yeah. because we will no longer have the courts to, as a as a bulwark to protect reproductive freedom. Now that's not to say that everything is terrible. <laughs> I know that was really depressing. I know. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but it is worth noting the wins, and there have been a few, but it's still worth noting. You know, the five Trump nominees have been, I should say, judicial nominees, executive nominees, or he goes right. through them. You know. Yeah. Real quick. Uh, But five judicial nominees have been defeated. Most recently, uh, Thomas Farr, who was nominated um, to a district court seat in North Carolina. And he was like, I mean, he's a known vote suppressor. He worked for Jesse Helms when he was sending out postcards to African-American voters telling them they were ineligible to vote. He ironically and bizarrely did not have uh, a demonstrated record on reproductive rights, but Narelle still opposed his nomination because we do have kind of allied positions mm-hmm. around um, around civil and voting rights, uh, among others. And in fact, I will say Senator Cory Booker really led the charge there. Um, his family is from North Carolina originally, I think his father. And, you know, he really did a lot of work to ensure that you know, Democrats being in the minority, that the entire Democratic caucus, Democratic caucus opposed uh, far, but also managed to convince some Republicans, including uh, it really came down to uh, Tim Scott. And he, so he was defeated just recently, which was amazing. And also Ryan Bounds was uh, defeated also with Tim Scott's opposition, who was no, he wrote a whole bunch of racist things when he was in college that uh, weren't known, I think, when he was originally nominated, and it came out after the fact. Um, and then there are a couple who have been withdrawn because they weren't going to get the vote. Mm-hmm. McConnell wouldn't have the votes. You know, one, uh, this guy, Matthew Peterson, who he kind of went viral. He's the one that a Republican senator, Senator Kennedy, on the Judiciary Committee started asking him just basic legal questions around, like, what different types of motions are and throwing softballs. You'd think he wasn't, though, because I, it was known that oh, okay. that he was not uh, very well qualified in terms of legal experience. He had never, I think, tried a case. Oh, uh, and Kennedy, I think, was right. basically, I think, I, mean, I can't speak for Republican Senator Kennedy, but but it certainly seemed like, based on what he was saying publicly, that, uh, you know, basically, you've, you've got to be kidding me, Trump administration. You can't find a conservative lawyer that knows anything about the law and so he's just getting annoyed um and asked him a series of questions that he couldn't answer in the hearing and the video basically went viral uh because i mean it was this man was humiliated but at the same time one might think if you don't never tried a case perhaps you aren't qualified to serve as a federal judge he clearly didn't suffer from that feeling of he was full of confidence i guess um, so that, and then at one of my, my personal favorite, and I'll just tell this because it's so ridiculous. <laughs> I can't not. Um, I have to admit, you always have kind of the best stories about <laughs> these guys. Kate really does track all of these people who are being appointed. So she definitely comes to meetings with like, okay, you will not believe what we just found. Because they, right, there's always this nugget of really <laughs> and truly crazy. So in the context of this one guy, uh, he was actually working in the Trump administration, uh, he was nominated for a district uh, judgeship. His name is Brett Talley. 
so he's in, he was actually in charge. He worked on the White House Council Office. So he was actually one of the people who was supposed to be helping nominees sort of get yes, their paperwork together, right. fill out questions. And so he basically lied on his questionnaire. He one of the things they ask is sort of uh, conflicts of interest and do you have any, you know family working in the White House, things like that. And he, I guess, forgot to mention that his wife was Don McGahn's chief of staff. That's right. I forgot. So that's adorable but also just as a fun fact and i guess i don't i don't know if people feel like they should disqualify you from being a federal judge but he was a ghost hunter that's that's he right i do <laughs> he is a member of the tuscaloosa paranormal society and personally i'm i just i really loved it i was a buffy fan maybe yeah, is yeah. why i like it so much but i i definitely wish almost wish not really but see, like part of me imagines bit. that a hearing <laughs> Just could have been really, really something else. Like, yeah. So on the new Ghostbusters movie, right? I assume you were against it because women, um, you know. But I just feel like, you know, how many seasons of Supernatural have you watched? Be honest. Um, I just feel, it, you know, it's important, I guess, to take the, the small funny things in yes. this otherwise terrible situation. Um, yes. But he ended up being withdrawn because I think that eventually the White House found that to be embarrassing. I don't know if the Wait, ghost hunter thing was embarrassing sure? or the Don McGahn thing, but I, the, the embarrassment, <laughs> like, oh, I mean, I think it's probably just that senators felt embarrassed, okay. and thus eventually they had to withdraw his nomination. Okay. Man, that guy. But so that sort of, I do think these sort of wins are really important. You know, as a, yes, because it is so easy to get <laughs> discouraged with the day to day losing so many mm-hmm. that you forget that we we can pull together and. Tank some of these. Sometimes, Sometimes. A little bit. <laughs> Not always. But it is, you know, I will say one of the things learned out of the Kavanaugh fight, it's sort of common, common knowledge that, maybe in D.C., that supposedly sort of Republicans or anti-choicers or the religious right or whatever care more about judges in the Supreme Court right. than progressives. And so it has this sense that Republican senators feel that they really need to support all of these extremists because their base really cares. And there's this sense among, I think, Democrats that they think their base doesn't really care. Um, And so it doesn't put the same pressure on Democrats to oppose. Knowing in the Kavanaugh fight, the way, the kind of extent to which the progressive base got engaged in that fight, um, and in the midterms, I believe one of the things that came out of that was really interesting was voters saying they were cons- taking SCOTUS into consideration as one of mm-hmm. the factors in voting, which is not typical. Sure, um, that is very much conventional wisdom, is that... It's a Republican it's thing. Republicans care. Right. And, and so, that's why they voted for Trump, is that exactly. they saw the Supreme Court. And so that's yeah. really become the ingrained story you hear over and over. And the truth is, they are. They are well aware, right? They had this... This plan was from, like, the 80s. Right. They, they, they do care about the courts and the truth is also that they're the conservatives have spent a lot of time and money in ensuring that their base cares and and progressives are coming to that late um Mm -hmm. trying to ensure that their base understands that the courts are a proxy for all these other things we care about or votes on these judges are a proxy rather for the courts which is where all of these things kind of come to come to a head and so hoping that progressives really keep that up you know there's something i think our field one of our field staff is saying you know, there's this sense that Republicans get call, calls from their base saying, vote yes on Stephen Clark, vote yes on Stephen Clark, vote yes on Stephen Clark, um, over and over and over again, because we might find that our base, the progressive base, you know, will call and say, they'll call their center and say, vote no on this mm-hmm. terrible person. But Repo- you know, the sense is that the Republican base doesn't call once. They call at the same person calling like every day on the same nominees or because they understand that fit flooding the phones on a daily basis and taking two minutes out of their day to call and do that um, really does put pressure on their senators. Um, and so it, it was an interesting thing in the Kavanaugh fight really needing to to understand and kind of think through, oh, right, our base is feeling, well, I just called yesterday. And it's sort of like, yes, I know, and thank you, but do it again today and again tomorrow and again the next day. And that is a a, sort of a different uh, way of engaging folks, asking them to do the same thing over and over and over again every day. Yeah. And it's... But it's important. (laughs) Dispiriting, living in Washington, D.C., as a D.C. resident who is among the disenfranchised, that was one of the times I just 
really felt the disenfranchisement. Yeah. Like, I could go out and protest and, you know, be in the building and in front of the Supreme Court, but, like, no I just felt so powerless. Yeah. And you really, I mean, you don't. Yeah. But, so, yeah. Side note. <laughs> um, okay. So, on the downside, but the bright side that we have blocked some people, what can people do to fight back? I mean, honestly, it is sort of what I said. It's really needing to get engaged and call your senators and tell them to oppose these people. Um, it's really essential. I, the other side is is supporting them, um, and we really need to demonstrate to our champions that we care as much or more than they right. care about preserving the courts as you know an independent judiciary that will uphold our constitutional rights as opposed to completely undermine or <laughs> get rid of them. Well, Kate, thank you so much for doing this. This was fun. My pleasure. It was really fun for me, too. I, this is the first time I've ever done a podcast, so this was wonderful. Well, thank you. did you. amazing. Thank you. <laughs> for more information, including show notes from this episode and previous episodes, please visit our website at reprosfightback.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at Repros Fight Back. If you like our show, please help others find it by sharing it with your friends and subscribing, rating, and reviewing us on iTunes. Thanks for listening.